Okay. As I was saying, this book, Shit Show, The Country's Collapsing and the Ratings Are Great, our, uh, my recollections, my take, my look at this country from the perspective of a television newsman, which is, I'm certain, the most superficial form of news there is. And that's what fake news means. It doesn't mean it's made up. Yes. It means it's superficial. It's insulting. It doesn't reflect your life, your accomplishments, your fears, your grandchildren, your children. It doesn't. And that's what happened in a nutshell. But I want to do this. I'm going through security, airport. They haven't paid those guys yet. And I took my boot off. And I got a couple sets of these. I get people to sign them. Charlie, fight the power. Roger Stone. I remember he signed that, and I said, Roger, you are the power. But not anymore. You know what he was doing? He was at a, in Vegas doing a fundraiser for the Bundys, a legal fundraiser. Except he didn't know Lavoie Finnicum's name, the guy that was dropped in Oregon by the FBI. It's in the book. Uh, mispronouncing his name. He had a, we had a, you know, mic on him. It was hot. And he knew it was hot, but he disregarded it. And it showed what a boob he was, what he did not know. Not, not even the, the dead person of honor did he know. And he's having his aide de camp, you know, Google the guy. And um, he gets up there and he's calling, he's telling people these people who are angry. And we can get into why the Bundys are angry and how they have a point. There is a point to that. He's not just a crazy nut. Roger Stone stands up there because he's doing info wars with Alex Jones now. Because it, an audience is an audience and a buck is a buck. And uh, he's saying the FBI wants to kill your children. And we're gonna ha they're going to have to be a revolution if they impeach Trump. And I'm like, what? I said to him, do you know what you're doing here? You, you're a Manhattanite and you live in D.C. And that's cool because I love, I love New York. But when you come out here and fuck around like this with these guys in this country, with everybody struggling and afraid and not sure what the government's doing for them, what your money's going to do in the future, if there will be retirement for you, how come the schools are terrible for your grandbabies, why the government comes in after 100 years and takes your property, and you're going to tell them to point guns. And the guys that they're, that they're pointing guns at are their own guys, right? A federal agent was, a, it was a, an Iraqi, an Iraq vet or an Afghanistan vet, as were these guys who have no reason, no place to be. They're going broke. They're underemployed. They live in a crappy suburban apartment, and they want to know where their America is. And that's nothing to hate or fear. It's worth talking. It's the same in Ferguson. You know what I mean? There's, when the cops pull a, four black guys over, because there's four black guys. That's, they, they do that. That's, they do that in Detroit. They do that in New York. They do that everywhere. And a guy gets pissed, and he gets a ticket. So if Ferguson is two-thirds black, why are 95% of the tickets go to black guys? And they did a study. White guys are the ones that have dope on them um, more times than not. So what, give, what gives when you lock a guy up for not paying his ticket, and he has to pay for his night in jail, and the deputy, this is FBI, did a study, FBI beats his ass, a black prisoner in Ferguson. The guy bleeds on the deputy, and the deputy sends him the dry cleaning bill. It's a fact. These are facts. So I, I submit to you, like, the problem is green. That it's class, and we don't talk about it. And when I did this book, I called Trump. Called it. Called in 2015. Told Michigan it was in play. Ohio it was in play. Excuse me a second. I even asked Trump at his first press conference if he would take my resume. Because, you know, he needs a vice president. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what the media said. It's the only time they laughed together. And I said, you're not saying it right. You're going to start a race war. I don't even know where you got your information, but part of it is correct. 
the Republicans offered the working class white one thing really goes back to goes back to Nixon Southern strategy right it's we're going to get rid of affirmative action that's pretty much what he offered the redneck and it's true it, that is racist it's racist to put one person in front of another person based on skin color but that's why we have affirmative action to undo the 400 years of doing that but what did the Republicans do and I voted Republican. I voted Barack Obama and Ronald Reagan. So I'm just the best thing in front of me kind of guy. Yes, David. No, 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 David was fine. They they didn't give him that. What they give him? A forever war, where he, his cousin, his son, her son, her grandson, granddaughter, go off to war, come home, and they have popsicle sticks for legs, and they wait in six months for a VA appointment, and they're faking it while people are dying, and you people are the ones who pay the bills, right? You should be angry. The rich don't pay, the poor cannot pay, and increasingly, they're in your pocket. And why aren't the grandchildren getting educated? Why do the roads stink? Why is the infrastructure falling? Where's our money? They shipped his job to Mexico. I'm from Detroit. It, that NAFTA uh, pff, didn't work. Sorry, it just didn't work. You tell it to my people. It didn't work for us. The value of your home collapsed. Your wealth went away. That's what he got. So he rebelled. Now, if you if you look, what's going on with the Democrats? They don't know what they are. That party cannot hold center either. Are we going to be progressive, way out here left, and you know, college for everybody when we can't handle grade schools for everybody, right? Are we the old school union that you know that's that's gone? you know, chicken in every pot. What is the center of that party? What are we? I leave that to you because I'm with you. I don't even want to be up like this. I'd rather be down. I'm with you. And that is the great problem with media. It's man girdles and makeup. And you, you know, I thought I nailed it. I thought I nailed it. On the block, real people's lives, right? How come nobody's under a bridge with the opioid skeleton? I, I know we have an opioid crisis, but I've never seen these people. You know, like my sister. Under the bridge, your life's wasting. Like, what does this shit do to you? Will one reporter snort one of those things for me, please? Because Dan Rather did it. 1958. Jazz musicians going through Texas. They caught him with heroin. Nobody knew what heroin was. Dan Rather went to the police station, sheriff's department, and they injected him with it. Sat there and filmed it. I reminded him of that when you know, we did a, you know, what do you call it, the traveling show to sell this book. He goes, you remember that? I said, of course I remember that, sir. What's old is new, what's new is old. But I thought that split screen, oh, no, we're, you know, expert in from uh, L.A. and, well, you know, I thought it was going to go away. It was going to be more amongst the people, but it didn't. I miscalculated. The split screen turned into an octagon. Have you noticed that? It's just jabber, jabber, jabber. Now they have two desks full of experts, and, and the host walks in between them now. And it's the worst television I've ever seen, and it, it's just ramping us up. And nobody watches it. Okay. The, the highest rated cable TV shows, 3 million people, like uh, Hannity, right? Lester Holt gets 10 million. But we're busy listening to the 3 million and the 7 million. We're 325 million. Get it together. Wake up. Like each other in your real lives. Do you have problems on the street? Do you have tensions? Is there racial tension? Is there gender tension? I submit to you, no. We're not far gone. We're still a united country. We're doing all right. The system just is a great system. It's just the culture of kleptocracy that's eaten it. We, you, I don't know what we, it, there, I never believed it before, but it is the press's job to hold them accountable because no one else will. I never, it's mumble jumbo, you know what I mean? I mean? I'm not trying to change the world, but I have to do the counting and the accounting. 
So when I broadcast it to you or print it, you know. But do you see what's happening in the L.A. Times? It's dead. St. Louis Post-Dispatch, dead. Detroit News, dead. The only thing going on is the Washington game. But what is Washington? It's the clubhouse for all the gangs, right? We send them from California, from Michigan. They divide it up. They take it home, and that's where it gets ripped off. When they tax me for the federal breakfast program, right? My daughter doesn't have it. Praise be to God. You know, I'm, thank you for having me. I'm going to pay for some breakfast. But in their school, they do. And as an elder of the community, I, I look to see what they giving the kids. I say, hmm, generic Pop-Tarts because it got strawberries in it, see? An orange drink because it has vitamin C in it, you see? Except when you took it out of my pocket, I was expecting orange juice. You took it from my pocket and it went to Washington and then Washington sent it to Lansing and then Lansing sent it to the school districts and somewhere in there, there's a contractor that changed it from orange juice to orange drink. And I'm paying for the baby to have some pulp. It'll make you mad. That, that's really the analogy. That's what's g really going on. So this book, oh, I followed Trump. Oh, I did. It was great. I loved the guy. It's a sound bite machine. But I always, I'm not like Jim Acosta. Sorry, Jim. Dude, I crossed the border with Mexicans. Three days, month in the house. You know, worked, worked the uh, laying sod in Long Island, you know, once we got there, you know, for the McMansion. Like, they told me to get, get off of them because Roger Ailes wanted to make nice with them. Remember, because Fox was trying to take them out. Remember? Remember Megyn Kelly? Remember Brent Baird? Remember the promise? And then it came to be that he's going to win. So, like, you get I go, I never fucked with the guy. I just used him. He'd say something like, build a wall. i go, I got a better idea, sir. Why don't we get the Mexicans to build it on their side? And then that way, all the guys from Home Depot will, in L.A. will run home to build it. And only when they're done will they realize they've sealed themselves out. <laughs> to which he's like, yeah, and they're going to pay for it. And I'm like, thank you. Excellent. And then what we do, that's just a cut point. It's a, an edit point. Because now what we do is we really show you what it is. Will it work? You want to know why a wall won't work? Okay, so this is the Rio here, right? You can't put a wall in the Rio. It'll wash away. Plus there's a treaty. You can't put a wall in the Rio. So you have to put it on land. So when you put, say, the fence, right, which you can climb, you can. You put it about right here. So you've just walled a piece of the United States out from the United States. Now, when you're an asylum seeker, all you have to do is touch soil. So you actually make it more difficult to apprehend them. Get it? And you want to know how the, the cartels are getting them over? Jet skis. Jet skis. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> you know, you get a little boating tour, and you get off and say, I want asylum. So this wall thing here is not going to work. This is the United States, this is Mexico, and this is La Frontera. That's a whole different country. And if you want to get this under control, you must get the Mexican government under control. It's corrupt. It's uh, a wash in narco money, people smuggling money. We don't have a treaty with Mexico where if it's a foreign national comes here, you, you repatriate them, you take them. We have that with Canada. Europe has that. Everybody has that. Why don't we have that? You take them. I mean, you might agree with me and you might not, but I'm just saying it's much better than building something that doesn't work, starving work and people are their check, right, and you're just yelling for days on cable news. Especially when the reporters don't know anything about it. Now, this book is good. It's, no, I'm telling you, it's good. I, I, it's the best book I ever wrote. This is Detroit Part 2. I wrote one called Detroit in American Autopsy. And the supposition was, are we an outlier or are we like the epicenter? 
I mean, we do it spectacularly in Detroit. It's ugly. I mean, the mayor's in prison for a world record, right? Uh, Tigers suck. Lions suck. Uh, GM went bankrupt. I say, oh, my God, it's the end. So this is part two. It starts out with me in Roger Ailes' office asking if I can go around the country. And I try to use his toilet. But you can't use his toilet unless it's an invitation. And only women get an invitation. And it ends, the, the new afterward, it ends with me. I am now a handyman at a diner in downtown Detroit. I fix the bricks. I fix the toilets. I fix the piping because I know how to do that. And I'm casting my lot with working people, with the mass. I want them to see me. You know what I mean? Plus, this is the diner, and that's where the newspapers where I used to work in Detroit are there. So, you know, I'm down there doing this, this right here, like kiss my ass kiss it because you're failing because you're not going after the power mark my words keep track i'm going to get the new mayor of detroit indicted for the same thing the old guy did the black guy so the white guy got to get it too right in fact he got to get extra because he already went to prison and we went bankrupt and the machines running eating us alive you know flint the water's poison it's in here in Detroit, you, your tax dollars, you sent us a quarter billion dollars to tear down. You know, you've seen the pictures of Detroit and all that. So bid rigging, collusion. And then when they tore them down, they took contaminated and poisoned highway dirt and threw it in the hole, which is much like the, the Flint water. In fact, the EPA, remember them they were supposed to be looking after? It's the same office. We're giving it the thumbs up, but I caught them. And I will do the handyman work. And I will work for a scrappy little website that's supposed to replace the void of the daily newspaper. It's not going to work. I don't know what we're going to do. You are smart people, right? You're not stupid people, but you're ignorant to facts. And once you know facts, then you're not ignorant. But who's going to, you, you're busy, you're doing stuff. So who's going to do that work? That's what scares me, but that's why I'm, I'm, you know, got a billionaire back in the website. Mayor sued me five times, five. Trump doesn't even do that. I'm like, I went to Cal Berkeley. We studied law. You know, you mayor, you're a public figure, dude. It's not going to work. I'm not afraid. So that's why I'm proud that you will come here. I know you will like this book. So it starts in Roger Ailes' toilet, and it ends with me fixing toilets. It's a nice thing. <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you what. Somebody raise your hand. Raise your hand, somebody, quick. Who's first? Okay, you. I believe this book is so good. I want you to close your eyes, not open your eyes. I'm going to tumble this like it's the lottery balls, okay? You're going to open it up, and you're going to put your finger on a word. And I'm going to start from there. Guarantee it. Okay, bro, don't look. I might back up to the beginning of the sentence so it makes sense. Okay, see what he's doing there? It's just like David Blaine. Hmm. Make America great again. I told you. It was brilliant in its simplicity. It was the economy, stupid. It's always been the economy, stupid. And it was the fault of the government and the big banks. The everyman had been forgotten and he was angry. We had seen this in our travels, low wages and strangled opportunities. It cut across all races, all parties, all regions. Make it great again. Fix it. Help us. I turned to Matt and Bob. We've got to track this guy down. He might be a clown, but he's on to something. They agreed, but the dawn of the dawn would have to wait because the very next evening, a deranged white terrorist named Dylan Roof, precise in plotting in his hatred, murdered nine black parishioners as they worshipped in a South Carolina church. The man's hope was to ignite a race war. chapter, Knights in White Satin. I called the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. Because you remember they took the Dixie down in South Carolina? I said, why don't we carpool? I'm going to be in town too. Well, me and the Grand Dragon. Oh, what a knucklehead. What a dope. What a pinhead. And by the way, those are the same guys that were in Charlottesville. Okay? Now listen to me close. Oh, you're being, you're being
being messed up here. Listen to me. It's the same people. It's the same. It's, it's three, four hundred guys. Nasty people. They're not the menace. They're dummies. But the, you notice, watch this. The press never told you how many of these assholes were in Charlottesville, did they? You saw the, you saw the tiki torches? You saw the nice way that you can stretch, you know. Uh, it's called a, yeah, long shot, uh, like a rack focus, uh, you know, focal point. It's a depth of field. That's what I was looking for. How many? One million? Half, half a million? 400. 400. They figured this shit out too. They figured out this phone. They, they figured it out. They figured we bite. We the media, we bite. Awesome. Right? Same idiots. Now, I don't like them. I don't like mayhem. And, you know, Antifa's a bunch of pricks, too. They were in Ferguson tearing it up. You know, white dudes in masks. That's, you know, we, we're, we got a camera on, on the looting. That's snitching, man. That's snitching, man. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. You're going to be lunch, boy. Your daddy paid for you to be here tearing shit up. Don't you know the beer truck doesn't show up when you burn shit? It's not the answer. It's not. Use the ballot box. I know. It's slow. It's not fast enough. That's what we got. And people, if you know, because you do know, they don't move fast. We're 90% we're animal. You know? When things change rapidly, we freak out. I didn't, I didn't invent you. But I understand you. Grand Dragon. I Google Earth is house. Nice, nice powder blue bungalow. Five minutes from Disneyland. It is a small world after all. Isn't it the most multicultural spot in the United States? And there's a Latino mowing his lawn. Close your eyes. I, I want you to read it. Okay, by the way, one more thing. About, the, about that, how many are there? Remember Trump? That was the biggest, longest race ever. Biggest, greatest. What did we get? Two weeks, two weeks of aerospace shots. Remember that? Of like the inauguration and, and experts doing hectares of, you know, how many people per square inch, right? And, and, and we couldn't count how many rednecks, how many races, how many Nazis were running around. I need to know. I need to know exactly how many but it doesn't fit our narrative. Okay. Go ahead. No, no, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> How's this look? It's pretty good. Okay. Anatomy will verify that there was an expert. When we arrived, a local constable had detained three Chinese people in new, clean tracksuits who had just made sure by jet ski. Chinese in tracksuits, marvel that. Bob and Matt and I, the camera guys, um, parked the van behind a hedgerow and waited for a jet ski to make a break for the American shore. When it did, we jumped out of the van and began rolling. There were two women on the back. One was plainly pregnant. I don't know if it was the cameras, Bob's red, white, and blue do-rag, or his speckled white legs and white socks, but the coyote freaked out, spun the craft around, and throttled back from Mexico, but not before giving me the finger and shouting, Motherfucker, you cost me money! <laughs> it was my old pal who had buzzed my kayak and threatened to cut my throat earlier, because I put on a red, white, and blue Speedo, blew up a yellow rubber kayak and a straw hat, and I'm, I'm just... Like a tourist paddling through the smuggling zone. They were pissed. Oh, they were pissed. Border Patrol was laughing. I smiled and waved. Spratt came walking up from no nowhere. He was escorting yet another reporter around the park. We were all there. CNN, Breitbart, Texas Monthly, BBC. Good God, where was Field and Stream? I pointed out the coyote on the opposite side of the river. He lifted the pregnant woman in his arms as though they were newlyweds and set her back on the sand. Why do I have to do your job, dude? I said to Spratt. No comment, he grunted. They'll be back once you leave. Should I go on or just we do another one? Let's do another one. This is, I'm telling you.
Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Just get his wallet. <laughs> Don't look. Oh, look at that. Okay. Right there. Okay. I'm going to read this whole section here. Lavoie Finnicum had literally asked for it, and Lavoie Finnicum received it. His death at the hands of law enforcement got a smattering of White Lives Matter chatter from his supporters, but little more. Most everyone knows if you run a police roadblock with a loaded Ruger in your pocket, it's not going to work out well. Finnicum was an exotic white man, an electrified exception, an extreme case whose death was orchestrated by himself in concert with his courtship of the camera. But what of the others who get no media attention, those who die in the culverts and alleyways under suspicious circumstances without an army of professional gawkers looking on? Since the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, the Washington Post had taken it upon itself to track down and tabulate every death by cop in the United States and the details surrounding those incidents. Few in the media knew before then that law enforcement agencies are not required to report incidents of deadly force to the FBI. Like all crime statistics in general, the reporting is voluntary and predictably woefully undercounted. The post analysis showed deadly force by police to be 250% higher than historically reported. That's amazing. Another finding may surprise you. In both 2015 and 16, about twice as many white people died at the hands of police officers as black people. In many of these cases, like the one of the suspected drunk driver in Tennessee who was shot multiple times through his rear window by a cop who jumped into his pickup bed, there was graphic video that should call to question the need for deadly force. So where was the media? To be clear, by any standard or measurement, let me say it again, by any standard or measurement, blacks tend to get the shit end of the stick in America. It should not surprise anyone that blacks, who are one-fifth of the population of whites, are two and a half times more likely to die at the hands of police. Acknowledged. But why the whiteout on white deaths? One would suspect that the statistics would reveal that the overwhelming majority of whites who die at the hands of police come from the shabbier side of the tracks. The poor white boy. The rough one with the bad teeth and the poor grammar. The rowdy one who misbehaves and fights at bars on Saturday night. The kind who might smoke meth, is underemployed, maybe a vet or an ex-con, a product of the desperate lower classes. This man has few friends in the media world because the media world is populated by the upper class white people, decidedly liberal, who at their cocktail tables discuss the notion of white privilege. The media no elite knows about white privilege because they are the embodiment of it. In their minds, they have convinced themselves that they have overcome this self paradox through education, intellectual magazine articles, world travel and psychotherapy, the white elite liberals feel they are no longer privileged. They are self-aware, world savvy, self-made. They are down with the program. They woke. In the hierarchy of American life, blacks are at the bottom and whites are on the top. And so the white media is down for the black man, which is a fine thing. But that only comes around when there's a catastrophe like Katrina or Flint or a police shooting. But again, what about the poor white man? The liberal white elite who have been raised with advantage but believe they have scrubbed themselves clean of it tag the poor white as the privileged one. But how could they know? They spent no time in his living room, his corner bar, his pistol room. <coughs> Excuse me. To them, he is a lout and a bore and a racist, and to dig any deeper is simply an exercise in inconvenience. And they seem to think he resides only in Appalachia, although he lives right under their noses from Boston to Bakersfield. So when these white men die at the hands of law enforcement, it is universally agreed upon by liberal white media types that they must have deserved it. After all, they reason, the black man is a target simply by virtue of his skin color. What possible defense could a white man muster? Police do not kill white people with all their privilege, unless they had it coming. The elite black media hops on board, or rather turns their heads away, as they too have had little contact with the white lower class. Their interests lie more in maintaining their credibility within the struggling black community to which they no longer belong 
if they ever did. Studies show what you should already know. Regardless of race, people are more violent the poorer they are. The more violent and poor they are, the more contact they're likely to have with the cops. There is a class issue in America, but the media seems determined to only see in stereotype and skin tone. Thank you. I know, I was writing that in my underwear. Like, where'd that come from? All right, come on. Hang on. Don't look. You're looking. I knew Middleton, and I wrote his name down many times in the docket books where he had made an arrest. He wore canine. Look at his holster on the left hip. Dick was left-handed. They had worked together for 20 years, and I asked Shivers about those times, his lawman's role in maintaining segregation, his participation in the booking and locking up of hundreds of children, King's letter written from his jailhouse. In my eye, I'd done nothing wrong while I was working, he said. I was just doing a job. We all were. I knew things was changing, and I'm glad they did. It wasn't right. A black person traveling across the country and couldn't use a bathroom. His time had come. But yeah, that is Officer Middleton. A wave of nausea overwhelmed me. I ran to his toilet and vomited. Looking around, I marveled at the cleanliness of the widower's toilet, the clean lip of the bowl, the fresh hand towels. This was a man of orderliness. I came back to his living room, and he refreshed my drink. I admire your work ethic, he said. I'm not going to go on with it, but you remember Selma, the 50-year thing, when all the media went there? I refused to go to that shit. I said, it will be no Selma without a Birmingham two years earlier. Remember that photograph of the, the cop with the one-way glasses and the, the black teenager and the dogs biting him here? That changed everything. Well, not, you know, I mean, that, that's when Kennedy woke up. And I said, instead of going to Selma and... You know, everybody's going to broadcast to you the marching across the bridge, and that's cool. There's going to be 10,000 reporters there. I said, I'm going to go find those two dudes in the photograph. Because 50 years later, it's, it's the same thing as Ferguson. And Dick Middleton, I found him, the cop. And you know what he said? One me. Shot me. One me. I mean, you, got, you, you heard shivers there, right? He come to terms with himself. He, he grows. Give everybody a chance to grow. We can do this. We don't, we don't have to fall apart. He grew. At least he figured out something to say about his piece of history. He booked Dr. King. Booked him. And then the cops say, when we really need him, when we need our elders, when we need our elders more than ever, when you feel like, you know, Millennials, fuck you, you're not even millennial. You're not even born in this millennium, right? You're with us. <laughs> My daughter's the millennial. We need you. And when he, he couldn't own up to it. I've been everywhere, man. I'm stunned. It's in the book. Madam, you right there, you see, you, you, yes. Can you just pass that back, pass, pass the bread to the sister? Close your eyes. My wife invented this. Okay. Okay. Uh, where's your finger? No, see, where's your finger? Okay, put your finger on that. Okay, now you pass. No, no, you see, it's, it's like a telephone game. His finger moved. Okay, that's cool, though. I like it. Somebody turn the page. Okay, you want to know? You want to know the truth about this? I talked to my wife last night. Thank you. Yeah. She goes, "How is it?" You know, because they had the writers cocktail hour. I said, "It's like a fucking Woody Allen movie." <laughs> Just ask you, Tash, who lay in a hospital bed. A fundraiser was put together for Utash's medical bills. His son was at the event, held at a local bar, collecting cash and well wishes for his father. Afterward, the son went to a strip joint on 8 Mile with an Egyptian theme. A 
according to what the police and the strippers later told me, Junior had himself a wild night at the Emporium. It ended with Junior calling the cops, complaining that one of the dancers had stolen 1500 bucks from him. When asked about the source of the money, the son cried, but insisted he had exaggerated the stolen amount. It was really just 400 bucks, he claimed, money from his unemployment check, and most definitely not money from his father's fundraiser. Maybe, who knows, life is sordid and complicated, and money doesn't just step off a curb. Besides, you know, those, you know how those people are. In the meantime, I called my friends, trying to find Deborah Hughes a new place to live. She was all that stood between freedom and prison for a handful of thugs. Someone was bound to kill her, but she refused to move away. It's the principal, she said. They're not going to run me out of my own home. They. The day Utash was beaten, another pocket of rage erupted in America. This one out west. This time it was white people, and they had guns. Things were moving fast, and so were we. And then we go to Bundy. want to do some questions or should I do one more? I'm going to read one more. Okay, because it's lonely drinking a bottle. Anthony Bourdain was a dear friend of mine. His mom introduced me to him back before he hit, you know, back before Kitchen Confidential in the New York article. She says, she was copy editor of the New York Times. I, I think you might make some, you, you, Tony, you guys are not alike. So I met Tony, kept in touch, Tony hits. Comes at, he did the Detroit episode based off my Detroit book. I found out I was in Denver doing his book tour, and, you know, the beer bottles and the shot glasses are laying around and a half-eaten hamburger because it's lonely. It's really lonely. And the phone's going off, and, you know, can we get a comment from you? I'm like, what the fuck? Thing is, he's the only guy that did every mile of that show. He had, like, four crews. Yeah? So he's gone 250 days a year. Lost his child to his wife in a divorce because you're not home. Yeah, he liked to party too. Alcohol's a depressant. His girlfriend is the Harvey Weinstein. I got raped with Harvey's tongue. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden she's getting accused of, you know, raping the boy. And it's like, this became his life. When you get caught up in the wires, it's really depressing. It, it looks like the greatest thing in the world, and, it, and it's not. So I'm, I feel like I'm like his little brother, and I just walk. You know, I ain't going out like that. So you're not alone. That's what's shocking. It's like, why, why would he feel like I feel? A little bit, right? Why would he feel like I feel? Because he's got everything I want. But not really. Would you pick the last one? Make, make it shorter, would you? I can't believe two people didn't come. Um, oh my God. Okay, thank you. I am gonna, bro, I'm just gonna read that paragraph just so I, I figured when I was walking there I should. Their set was blue, their makeup thick, their clothing immaculate. There was no one telling where in the world they were broadcasting from, but surely it wasn't Ferguson. Still, that did not prevent them from commenting on the evening's mayhem as if they had been there, as if they had grown up here and understood the nuances and complexities of American life. What the world heard from them was that this was simply another case of a white cop killing a young unarmed black man and the looters and arsonists were simply voicing their historical discontentment and here was another case of the abject failure of the American experience. I watched them and wept. Which question, bro? Okay, good. Frankly? He said, oh, yeah, good point. He goes, what do I want you to walk away feeling here? I don't care. No, I, I, you know what I mean? I'm not being a smart ass. Feel what you want. Whatever you feel, I respect. You know? It, 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 dude, it's just, it's just a dancing monkey here. Try to book, and then get a hold of me on Facebook and tell me what you think. That's all. You can do it. I'll take it if you find it. If you find my... I'm not giving it to you. Think what you want, man, and I will respect it. But, it, yes, sir.
He says, what is my opinion about profit motive stoking division? 100% absolutely. 100%. 2008 is not over. We papered over the maggots with quantitative easing and tax cuts and it's horseshit, right? And the value of your homes are overinflated again. And every time the Fed raises the uh, interest rate one quarter of 1%, the world goes into hysteria, huh? It's look at Brazil. Look who they just elected. Look at the gasoline riots in uh, Mexico. Look at Venezuela. Look at Egypt. Look at they got a new Stalin in Russia, a new Hitler in Austria, a new Mussolini in Italy, a new Franco in Spain, a new Chamberlain in the UK. They've got official camps in Germany again and official ghettos in Denmark. No. Money, bro. Was it there when we were rich? It's the human things in there, that hate and bigotry. Yeah, but when you lost your wealth, you, you know, it's, look, man, we're animals. It's stuff. You know, dogs, will, dogs don't kill each other, but they will hurt each other when it's, a, when it's a yard. We are that. I do believe. I can't say it's all of it, and it's just, it's, it's a money and an equity thing, a lot of it. And then we're in a new era here. We're in a new era of, of, you know, instant communication, you know, glo globalization, mass migration, digitization, so many automation. And what's going to happen in 15 years? How, how many jobs are going to be lost? What are we going to do? That, I do believe that, yes. Madam. It's not. It's not, but remember, Roosevelt saved capitalism, right, by some social programs because the communists and the socialists and the unions were, were going to blow this thing up, right? And slowly we undo it. First the communists go, you know, the hearings on un-American un activities, and, and then socialism rhymes with communism. That's next to go. Then the unions go. Uh, things will be back. I've always said socialism will have a comeback once they burn through everybody. Right? You get, you get, Bangladesh has to feel it, like a loss of wealth. China is going to be a problem. Standard living went like this, and it might go like that, and then you'll have problems. Maybe. But, yeah. I want my social security. Is that a way out, whacked out, left wing thing? Then so be it. But I believe you got to work and, and pay into it. And I'm not going to pay for a grown man, his food the rest of his life. You've got to try to earn a living, dude. And we will all contribute to the federal program because we agree babies do not go hungry in this country. Can I get an amen to that? Babies do not go hungry. So I guess, uh, you know, we'll see. It's, it's very difficult now, isn't it? Because there is no platform. <laughs> That's why Gummy got it with the wall. No offense. My mom voted Trump. I'm just, the wall, the wall. It's easy. It's tough. Oh, Got to go. Cut it. One, one last one. Two less. Two last ones. Yeah. 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 Can Mexico write itself? We shall see. I mean, we shall see, right? It's, it's, it's international pressure. Last one. Oh, you're a reporter, aren't you? Word them up. Um, yeah, Milwaukee, in the book. Milwaukee in the house. What a bunch of cowards running that town, right? Nobody went to the corner. Uh, so stay, local TV news sucks. Fix it, dummies. Right? With the, with the coffee in the morning and look at the yoga. Like, get your ass out there. And cover stuff. And you can make, Google it. Okay, just Google it. Google the work. You can show up in a bathrobe to the mayor's office. Hey, mayor, the water's dirty. I took a tanker of fresh water, like one of the gas tankers, to Flint with some showers. And they were supposed to give me a permit so babies could have a clean shower. And then they, they wouldn't, they took my permit back. I said, okay. 
I want my 25 bucks back. So then it became me arguing with the mayor, and then she got the police on me, and I'm running away from the police in my water tanker, big silver water tanker. And, and then Trump landed in town. I didn't know he was coming. And then we're, we're chasing Trump, and the police are chasing us, and that is TV. <laughs> and it says a lot. So everybody got to just work harder. You know what local TV reporters got to do? Hey, dude, take the, the documents and the budgets and the contracts home, open a bottle of wine and a pack of cigarettes, and do the work for free. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it.